got John McClellan and Johnny McDonald, and we got another bearded wonder with us. Always great when we get a chance to spend some time with Mike Tanya from uh, the New York Times. Uh, Mike, I know you checked in early, so you heard the uh, little end of John and I going back and forth. I'm a bigger Patrick Queen fan than he is. Um, we were using analytics to evaluate how Patrick Queen should be looked at. So I'm going to start you with an analytical question. Really simple one, as a matter of fact. Over, under. Catches during the season by J.J. Arcega-Whiteside on the Atlanta Falcons, one half. The over-under is one half. Will J.J. Arcega-Whiteside catch one ball for the Atlanta Falcons this season? Where are you getting over-unders on J.J. Arcega-Whiteside? What sports I just signed happen? yesterday with the Falcons. I figure we showed J.J. some love. Supposedly... The owner of the Philadelphia Eagles was a big fan of J.J. Osegui. Oh, and yeah. He loved believe, it. believe uh, that he, he – uh, John, what were the three picks that uh, the owner is – uh, The only the three influence? picks were magically uh, Lane Johnson, uh, uh, Russell Wilson, and uh, Jordan Mailata. The only those were, three, those uh, were the Jeff uh, Lurie influence. Uh, yeah. Three and, for- and, and much to his chagrin, at least by some part, is reporting – uh, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, that one hasn't quite worked no. out. But because of that, J.J. will always be remembered here in this town. Yeah. So I'm allowing you, Mr. Tanya, to tell us, will he or won't he catch a pass for the Falcons this year? What position is he labeled at? Wide receiver, tight end, or long snapper? It doesn't matter. All he's got to do is catch a pass. He can play He can play any one of them if he catches well, a pass. I, it, you know, more... Reception. To add that kind of dynamic uh, playmaking ability to B. John Robinson and Kyle Pitts and Drake London, even though you don't have a quarterback, you don't need a quarterback, right? Atlanta's they're doing things the right way, right? Mike? Mac-, Mac Hollins is there too. Yeah. Well, good, fair point. The, the entire 2019 okay. special yeah, teams is there. Yeah. And B. John fair Robinson point. was all but an eagle, if you believe some of the eagle fans, that oh. uh, they, they should have taken yeah. him, but they – Unfortunately, yeah. did not. He was all but an eagle, all but a bill, all but a cowboy. I'm going under on JJ Ortega Whiteside, but I'm not taking the action. I'm not betting on somebody getting one catch because week 18 could come of that. That's right. That's and true. it could be benching everybody and everybody could be injured and he catches a screen pass. And good for him. <clears throat> That's so true. That's that. true. He was on the Seahawk practice squad for months last year, so he may be on the. Is he too old now, John? With the what? I I can no, use they, You can put anybody on the practice squad now. You can have veterans on the practice squad. Yeah, he's, yeah. it's been a while. He actually is considered a veteran at this point. Uh, so surprisingly, so it just seems like JJ was drafted last week, but that's <laughs> that's me. Um, Mike, we appreciate you uh, jumping on board. I will ask you another statistical question. PFF came out with their quarterback rankings and had Jalen Hurts at seven. Sam Munson. I want to make a correction. Not PFF. Sam okay. Munson. Sam Munson of PFF yes. came out with his quarterback rankings. Is Sam Munson disrespecting Jalen Hurts ranking him as the seventh quarterback in the league right now? I'd have to look a little bit at the at the procedure, the logic. He's saying quarterback, not passer, I would assume. So he's... You know, quarterback, back, rank. quarterback rankings, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, seven sounds, sounds without low. sitting here and counting sounds kind of okay. I mean, Patrick Mahomes, I hope is number one. Um, Burrow, uh, Herbert, Rogers, yeah, Mahomes, Josh Lamar. Allen. Wait, yeah. Herbert's ahead of him. Herbert's ahead of him. Aaron oh. Rodgers, your favorite, is ahead of him. Lamar Jackson is ahead of him. I think that sticks with people. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. That. That's. Because for okay, Aaron Rodgers, you're saying, well, based on what he did a couple of years ago, he's still this. And yeah, with yeah. Justin Herbert, you're saying, well, if everything else around him is super extra special perfect, he's going to be this. So you're projecting that, projecting that Lamar Jackson will have 2019 returns and he never gets hurt again, and all these other things happen. I love Lamar, but that's a little bit of a projection. I can't I could see justifying any one of them based on like a logic <clears throat> above Hertz, but all three of them above Hertz. It's just projection, projection, projection. Ignore what's actually happening right now on the field, which is Jalen Hurts leading this team, winning games, doing things with his arms and legs. And but that's, I guess, that's PFF logic. I, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and 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 to be fair, I mean Trevor Lawrence is eight right behind, so there's a lot of projection there yeah. uh, at number eight. Yeah. With and I like Trevor Lawrence a lot, but uh, you know, there's. Uh, just a ton of projection, but that's 
You know, I call this disrespect. I'm starting disrespect season. Like everybody disrespected all the time. Am I disrespecting uh, Patrick Queen too much? Jody says I'm disrespecting him too much. He did. You, you know, one thing about PFF, they hated Patrick Queen from Jump Street. He did have a very bad rookie year. Jump Street. When when somebody sort of gets a a reputation there, they kind of keep it. Yeah. I, I think Queen has improved. I, oh, I, he's I, definitely improved. And you can see the absolute talent. He's one of these guys who will run himself out of position. He can he can run like the wind, and sometimes he'll get beaten on a fake and things like that. And when you do things like that in the PFF method, it's like, oh my god, he bit on a play fake, didn't get back on time. And you get like a negative twenty seven in the ranking. <laughs> you, you do all these other things. By right. the way, Devin uh, Devin White. Same thing to me. Yes. Um, so athletic, so explosive. I've never seen anybody, Mike, have a three-game stretch like he had mm-hmm. in route to winning a Super Bowl. He he was the best player on that team, including Tom Brady. Right. He was the best player on that team. And in a regular season, it, it, all he is is an athlete running himself out of plays. Right, right. So if you're talking about somebody like Queen saying, well, what if you trade for him? And what if you change his role and things like that? You have to respect the amount of talent that's there and that maybe he didn't jive with the coaches, didn't jive with Wink, the other coaches there, and say he's got that value. On the other hand, I think you do have to reflect maybe this guy's a liability in coverage to a degree that you have to be concerned about him. But, I mean, if I had Queen, I'd be finding ways to work with him. I wouldn't be like, oh, we got to replace Patrick Queen because, you know, sometimes he makes mistakes in coverage. I just think he'd be a nice fit for the uh, Eagles defense uh, for this upcoming year. All right. We haven't had you on since the NFL schedules came out, Mike Tanier. And John and I both have fun, kind of poking fun at some Eagle fans. The disrespect (laughs) for the opening up in New England. How dare they do that to the NFC champs? It just utter disrespect and the like. I actually (laughs) think the Eagles schedule worked out really well for them. They start with very winnable games. You knew when the schedule came out, damn, there are much better teams on this year's schedule than last year. So there was going to be a segment of the schedule that was going to be difficult to get through. Oh, they have that week 10 through week 15. And then you had to finish up Giants, who you own, Cardinals, Giants. It starts easy, it ends easy, and you got the real test right in the middle, which you're going to have to do when you get to playoffs anyway, play all the good teams. I think the NFL couldn't have done the Eagles more uh, of a favor by lining up their schedule the way they did. How about you? Yeah, I think there's like some boogeyman teams at the front, especially for Eagles fans. Well, the Patriots are going to be a boogeyman team, no matter how weak they are, no matter how like yeah, unimpressive Mac Jones is, they're always a boogeyman. The Vikings, your, your mileage may vary on whether you take them seriously or not, but they're a playoff team. The Buccaneers still have this, you know, you still have Tom Brady, you still have a playoff loss a couple of years ago in your head, even though they're not on the team. Okay. That's, that should be a 3-0 and start. That should be a 3-0 and start if the Eagles are the team who they claim to be, and I think they are, um, that, that middle is brutal. That middle is brutal. But you're, it's right. You, you can see a situation where they take two, three, four losses in the middle of this Chiefs, Bills, 49ers, Cowboys gauntlet, and then come out and get three wins at the end and position themselves well in the playoffs. So, yeah, I think it makes sense. I honestly don't care when they play in primetime or when they don't play in primetime. Frankly, I like it when they play in primetime more because it's easier for me to watch all the other games uh, at 1 o'clock, and I think some fans agree on that. Um, But the big issue is it is a tougher schedule. No matter how it lines up, it's a much tougher schedule than last year, and that's going to impact probably our expectations for the Eagles this year and what their final results are going to be. Yeah, that's fair. Um, NFC East as a whole, Mike, I think, you know, we all expect it to be a two horse race at least. And then it's kind of, uh, what do you feel about the New York giants? Um, we've been having a lot of fun with disrespect. I, I disrespect the giants. I'll raise my hand. I don't believe in the New York giants. Where, where are you on the scale of the belief with the New York giants? I'm with you. I think they were a 500 ish team last year that made the playoffs. I think they're a, 500 ish team this year. I, I, they, they're an odd team not to have tried to really, really improve themselves. They're an odd team that said, Oh, we're going back, we're running back with Daniel Jones and Saquon 
and things like that. Now, I think part of what they're doing is they're trying to build very methodically, and that's why they didn't go in and go all in this year. They could look at this division and say that's that could be a waste of money. The Giants did that in the past. It failed. But, you know, I see them as pesky, but I don't see them as some team that's going to go out and make this leap and compete with the Cowboys and the Eagles. So if Joe, Joe Shane did it right, they had a good draft. All right, they're not catching the Eagles, and they're probably not catching the <clears> Cowboys <throat> this year. But do you think they're doing it? Uh, are they doing justice to their fan base by going? Listen, we know we're in nine seven and one. We know we want a playoff game, but truth be told, we know the Eagles and the Cowboys have better roster than us. We're going to do this step by step by step. Do you think the new general manager and the assist from the coach are actually doing it the best way? I think so, with the caveat that they inherited such a weird situation from Gettleman that they're still sort of grinding out what's happening. And I think they were caught off guard by their own success last year. I think the logic there was, we're going to go out there with Danny Jones. He's going to kind of prove once and for all, he's like this third tier, fourth tier guy. And we're going to start over and we're going to win five games and Saquon's going to get hurt again. Instead they have this great season. <laughs> and, and so you're, you're, you're kind of as a general manager, you're kind of fish nor foul because you can't just jettison these guys. You do see some growth from Daniel Jones. And one thing they did well is they came up with a contract for him, which boils down to like a two-year mid-tier contract. They didn't give him Jalen Hurts money. So they're, they're trying to play both sides towards the middle, and that is very delicate. So I think on the one hand, they did the right thing. We're going to build slow and steady, <clears throat> slow and steady. The flip side of that is I don't think Giants fans necessarily see it that way. They think that Jones has arrived, Saquon should get a $90 million contract or whatever, and this team should have done more in the offseason to yeah. – can't catch the Eagles and Cowboys. And by the way, to be fair, I think the Giants are headed in the right direction. I think they're finally making good decisions. I think Joe Shane is a, has proven to be one of the better young GMs yeah. in football. I love Brian Dayball as a coach. I just don't think they're ready uh, from a talent perspective. I, NFC as a whole, Mike, when we look at this Eagles team, they have some issues, a lot of different faces on the defensive side of the ball. I'm a little bit more concerned about the continuity on the coaching staff because I went through it in Super Bowl 52. Yeah. I mean, Frank Reich left, John D. Filippo left, and it wasn't the same. I, I, I think it's something to keep an eye on. But clearly, this is a talented team, especially it's not the AFC where you got a bunch of talented teams. Who 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 will be – the challengers to the Eagles for NFC supremacy. Other than San Francisco, I think we all know that's a good football team. They got to figure out quarterback. Yeah. Anybody ready to make that leap to be a, a real contender on the NFC side? The Cowboys are sitting right there. You know, you add Brandon Cooks as like your number two receiver. That's significant. You add Stephen Gilmore as your number two cornerback. That's significant. Um, so, you know, they're, they're quietly putting the things in place to get better. You know, probably have a healthy Dak Prescott instead of Cooper Rush for an entire season. Those are significant improvements. They get a little bit of an easier schedule this year than last year. A little easier compared to the Eagles even, I think, right now. That's it. Beyond that, it is hard to say. And the 49ers, like you said, it's hard to say. You know, I, li I like razzing the fans from other fan bases, you know, and I like rising Falcons fans for some reason, because they're, you know, they're still mad about 28 to three and Falcons fans will come at me and say, you know, we're a 10, 11 win team this year with Bijan and Desmond Ritter. And I'll like, I'll like joke at them and razz them a little bit. And then I'll look at their schedule and I'll look at the guys they added on defense, like Jesse Bates. And I'll be like, mm, you're right. The, the conference is so bad. The NFC is so bad. The NFC South is so bad. That, yeah, you go out there like sort of professional with a good defense and a good running back. You might be a 10 or 11 win team because you're going to feast on the Buccaneers with Baker Mayfield. You're going to feast on the Panthers who have nothing besides the rookie quarterback. So that's what we're looking at. The other challenger is probably going to be some team like the Vikings last year who wound up winning 12, 13 games, getting home playoff games because they faced it on these weaker schedule. Could be the Lions, for example, who I think are a lot of people's darlings. Uh, things break the right way. Jordan Love do not work out. Vikings fall back to earth. All of a sudden, the Lions are this team that you have to worry about. Here's my Dallas question for you. Who's getting Ezekiel Elliott's 231 carries and 12 touchdowns this year for Dallas? A anybody. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's fine. Pollard can take some of it. I'm actually looking at who, who their backups are right now. Deuce Vaughn's a pretty good – I don't know anything about the other guys on this uh, lineup. Somebody's got to do that work, uh, Mike. <laughs> 
It, you don't just uh, create 12 touchdowns like Zeke had last year. You do create 12 touchdowns because you create okay. them by passing the ball down to the one yard line and giving them to whoever. Yeah. Which is kind, which is kind of how those touchdowns get generated there. So uh, those touches are going to get absorbed by CD Lamb, by Brandon Cooks, by Michael Gallup, by the new tight ends, etc. So they got. You think they throw the ball that much more this year because they don't have Zeke Elliott? They throw they throw the ball more, and those run it those those carries are absorbed by a bunch of guys that we had never heard of. And when he, they go out and they get a 15, 20 yard run here and there against the six man box where the safeties are back, you know, in the parking lot. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We know okay. about that, Mike, in Philadelphia. We know well, about say, that. You know, like, like if, if they get, if they had Boston Scott, would you be like, well, Boston Scott's going to absorb those guys. Well, Boston yeah. Scott's a pretty good ball player. There's guys on the Cowboys bench who are good enough to take up most of Zeke's value. All right. Well, let's talk about that from an Eagles perspective. If I said the Eagles lose Miles Sanders, you know, he's in Carolina. He's one of their few playmakers along with, uh, Adam Thielen that uh, C.J. Stroud's going to have to deal with. Um, it, it, if I said who's going to be the lead back in Philadelphia and I give you Rashad Penny, DeAndre Swift, or who cares, or which which <laughs> one is, is, is more important to you? Uh, it's probably who cares because <laughs> behind this offensive line, they're going to get production from this combination guys, just as the Cowboys will with their offense, they have a pretty good offensive line still. So I'm, what I think will happen is it'll be Penny until he gets hurt. Penny's is injury prone. That's, that's pretty well established. It will be swift. Unless swift starts making some kind of like mistakes that kind of frustrated the coaches out there in Detroit, where he had a very good offensive line. And if you committee these guys and you throw Gainwell, Scott, whoever else is out there, you're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. What matters is offensive line continuity, which the Eagles have, hurts. I was worried more about finding a better slot option, finding a better tight end two option than the Eagles have right now. I was a little disappointed that they didn't make a lot of effort in that place. But I'm not worried at all about what happens at running back because this committee could wind up putting together 1,800 yeah. yards easily. And by the way, real quick before you jump in, Jody, I met Bryce Young. I know I said CJ. It's for, for Carolina, so I got to correct yeah. myself. You know how people are. <laughs> yeah, quick, quick to uh, point out mistakes. All right, let me try and make a mistake here then. Um, who's going to replace Roger Goodell when Roger's done? There was a Ursay saying yesterday, we're probably going to have a new structure to the NFL. We'll have a CEO who will be in charge of business, and then a commissioner will be in charge of football. So it's going to be two jobs. How are football fans going to handle it? They love to shoot their ire at Roger Goodell. Now you're going to have to split it to two guys, a CEO and a football guy. How the hell are football fans going to be able to get upset with the National Football League? That's a good point. I think Ursay lost track of the fact that Goodell's biggest job it was is to go out there and be the guy yeah. that everyone yells at. Like, be the heel, the lightning rod. He's yeah, the heel. They're the true heel for you. Yeah. Roger Goodell's the heel, Johnny yeah. Mac. You are 100% correct. Yeah, you guys yeah. call him, he's the Bond villain, right? He's Blofeld. Yeah, like, yeah. He's stroking the cat in, in his basement. You remember the pandemic? He had he had the cat in his basement yeah, that's stroking it point. like Blofeld. It's the Bond. Yeah, that, yeah, that's his job. So what would happen is I think that job would fall to the CEO, if that's how they do it, if they, they do it by the way Ursa is discussing it. And the CEO yeah. would probably be somebody with no football background whatsoever. Um, and that would make, that person would probably be the heel. Okay. Yeah, but here's here's where I, I might have to dif differ and disagree. I think Adele gets as much heat for anything else as he does being Dean of Discipline. That when he gives out the punishments to the guys for what they did, and oh, it doesn't compare completely to this other punishment <laughs> that he's given out. To That's what he comes under fire for more than anything else. And I got to believe that'd be the football guy. You're not going to make the CEO guy become the dean no, of discipline, yeah. are you? It'll definitely be the football guy. The football guy will be the Roddy Piper. He will be the guy. <laughs> and, and by the way, if Roger Goodell was smart, he would, he would when he did leave, he'd say, I'm so good. They got to get two people to replace me. <laughs> and then just leave as this great heel. <laughs> Well, the thing is, he's not going to leave for like what three, four years. I yeah, forget yeah, the contract. Got, so yeah. this is so future. So maybe you need three guys. So I think they were using John Runyon for a while as a discipline guy. Yeah. Oh yeah, he still he's is. Perfect. Let the inmate yeah. run the asylum, right? Yeah. So you have that person there, and then you have Troy Vincent as the football guy who's like kickoffs and things like that, etc. 
and then you have the CEO and then you have the triumvirate or, or whatever. I can't picture it right now. And I think the thing is, like we said, if Goodell's still here next year, year after that, year after that, we don't necessarily have to picture it. Yeah. But when it comes, there'll, there'll be a bad guy and we'll know who it is. And, and Mike, uh, you, you do a lot of work with numbers. So when you hear the NFL come out and say, oh, this new kickoff rule is going to be 7% less kickoffs and 14% less concussions. Do you just roll your eyes like me? <laughs> I mean, where are these numbers coming from? Where are these studies? I oh need, my God. I need, where are they getting this? They just say it and people <laughs> repeat it. Yeah. I, I think someone did some numbers somewhere. I'm afraid <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't make them up. Whether they did them well or not, they did them in some way. And the, the trick to that is if you just take two or three years ago's numbers and say, well, this is what the numbers were and they're going to change, you forget the simple fact that these coaches are going to come up with something else. So the reason why there were short kickoffs going to the three-yard line and guys running them out from the three-yard line and injuries resulting from that is because when they moved the kickoff to the 25, Bill Belichick said, hey, you know what's better than a touchback? Some dude taking a pooch punt at the corner of the one-yard line and trying to run with it, we can get him on the 15. So you get these. So when you change the rule, the Belichicks and the Harbaugh's and the special teams genius coaches are going to come up with something else along the way. So I've heard people say, why don't they do the XFL version of the, the kickoff? Why, why don't they eliminate the kickoff altogether? And I think the reason why is I, it's hard for me to imagine football without kickoffs. It's just part of the game. But I, I don't think I'd miss the kickoff in about two or three years after it's gone. I don't miss touchback, touchback, touchback. That's what no, we often why see. Why would you? Yeah. Right. Touchback right. is it. I, 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 I would advocate banning it rather than what they're doing now. It's like, what? what's the point? Just ban it. Start it at the 25. Uh, the point is, I think they can sandwich a commercial in. Good That's point. a good, that's a very good point. Good that's point. an outstanding point. I didn't even think about yeah. that. Get another commercial yeah. in there. Yeah. Make some more money. Uh, all right, Mike, I asked you enough numbers questions, so now I'm going to ask you a subjective question. Because John and I have been kicking this around all off season, and it'll start to play out when the season starts. The Eagles have changes coming, personnel. They lost a lot of free agents. They brought some guys in. They had a very good draft and everything else. But they lost both their offensive coordinator and their defense coordinator. Now, they have a very good head coach. We like Sirianni and think that he's moved up quite quickly in the ranks of NFL coaches after only two years. How big a loss is this going to be for the Eagles? They introduced both uh, their offense coordinator and defense coordinator to the media for the first time just a couple of weeks ago. Both were pretty impressive to me, but talking is one thing. Actually, coaching is another. Yeah. How big a factor is it going to be for the Eagles that they have two new coordinators going into the season trying to defend the NFC championship? It is so hard to say. And when you go through the history of, you know, Super Bowl losing teams, championship teams, they lose their coordinators all the time. And it's it's a hodgepodge. Sometimes the team turns into an assembly line of coaches, and sometimes it falls apart immediately, and you can't tell along the way. Uh, the reason why, I, as a fan, I wouldn't push the panic button is because of the level of continuity, particularly offensive and defensive lines. And I would throw the secondary into that. Okay, these these coaches are taking over veteran groups on both sides of the ball. They're not like making wholesale changes on both sides of the ball. There. The Eagles remain strong on the offensive line. They've rebuilt kind of on the defensive line, and they made that point of keeping a lot of guys in the secondary. That should bulwark them if they have a downturn in coaching, and that's what I'm hanging my hat on right now. All right, last one from me, at Mike Tanier. Make sure you follow Mike on Twitter, uh, New York Times. Uh, uh, you can read them there. Uh, Mike, we, we talked about kickers, kickoffs a little bit, so uh, why not end it with punters? This is partially to get this news to Jody as well. Matt Ariza is visiting with the New York Jets today. Um, but as a whole, punters, at, at, are we getting to the point where, you know, there was that – I'm sure you remember that one high school coach – uh, this is probably about 10, 15 years ago. I wish I remembered his name. Doesn't punt. Mm -hmm. Does not punt. Just keeps going for it, going, no matter where he is. Yeah. Are we getting to the point where the punter and the kicker 
they might be gone sooner than we expect. That one's hard to say because on the one side you have that. On the other side, you have the Eagles going for it more than any other team yeah. this last year and doing so more in the past and other teams going there. On the other hand, Ryan Stonehouse of the Titans pretty much sent the, set the putting record. That's true. That, yeah. what, so what a you, leg. What a leg. So you have these guys who, when you need them, can put the ball 55, 60 yards down the field consistently. So I I can't imagine them disappearing. And because they're so specialized jobs, and that kicker when it's time for a 55 yarder is so important, and that punter when you are backed up to your own end zone is so important, I think that they're always going to be a punter and a kicker on an NFL roster. And I think they will be two different guys. It's just a matter of, I think we're at the point now where we generally don't think about them much or care about no, them. We, no. we, we worried about Sip Oss in the playoff game when he was shanking them. You only then, worry about them when something goes wrong. They're like long snappers at right. this point. Um, you don't, you never pay attention to the long snapper until you get that first crappy snap. Right. Same so, thing with kickers at this point. Right. So what I think we might say is you want to let that guy who can kick it 50 yards consistently and maybe a guy who is a fake threat. Wow, know, somebody who could be a fake. Like Johnny Hecker was for years. Yeah. Where he throw the ball pretty well. Or like Telchik who could run back way back in the day. And beyond that, it's, it's just a guy. It's just a functionary on your roster. All right, uh, I'm going to get one last question. I was going to wrap it up, but since McMullen went there, I now have to go there with you, Tenure. <laughs> You've heard the phrase ringing in my ear. Did you hear the ringing in your ear because somebody was talking about you? I'm asking you if you heard the ringing in your ear yesterday when Aaron Rodgers pulled up with a calf cramp in Jets practice because I think I saw a tweet of yours say recently, I made a living out of making fun of the Jets. You <laughs> laughed. I heard it. Karmically, I heard you laugh when mm -hmm. it was reported that Aaron Rodgers had a leg cramp at Jet Camp. Was I correct? Uh, I heard the ring in the ear when he started talking about all he knew about New Jersey was the Jersey Shore show, was the situation in Snooky, And that was like ringing in my ears. And all I could think of is Aaron Rodgers, I, I love New Jersey. You guys love New Jersey. Yes. We love the shore. We love the casinos. Aaron Rodgers is not going to love New Jersey. So stop no. pretending you're going to love New Jersey, Aaron Rodgers. He'll be fine. The cramp will heal. He's not used yeah. to working this time of year. The cramp is going to heal. But we're, we have not heard the last of Aaron Rodgers' misadventures up there in Florham Park, up there in North Jersey. Yeah, we're yeah. going to get Aaron Rodgers down here to South Jersey. We're taking him to Pondio's yeah. Diner, the only place I have ever hung out with McMullen. Uh, great place. To, yeah, don't worry about it. Aaron, we'll get you down here. It'll be great. Uh, my tenure, it is always fun whenever you come aboard. Appreciate it much. We'll certainly get you up again once the camps get open. Thanks for jumping in with us today. Always a pleasure, guys. Enjoy the summer. Yeah, Is thanks, it actually going to come? I, I'm waiting for the it's summer. It's going to come this up. afternoon. It's going to be in the 80s, Jody. You got <sighs> 40s in the morning. And then 80s. I'll have to put my coat on again tomorrow morning to get the dog out. What yeah. the hell? Yeah. It's tough. Not happy about the weather. All right. Uh, McMullen and McDonald coming back. You know what we got to do. Put a bow on the show. Do you stream on?